the idea of such festival is the the dance, uh, especially with the sacred dance or music. These uh, sometimes I think right sort of way of communication with uh, the public uh, to some individual that's more sort of I think uh, effective than just mere sort of uh, uh, say, uh, uh, words. song that the wood thrush sings. You la li, doo doo doo. Music that comes from the heart, that's sacred, because it comes from a special place. Sacred means what we respect. Our hearts are full, our minds are good, and our ancestors bring us strength, and they give us strength. And um, they tell us to stand tall, sing and dance, and. It's around us. It's where it's in us. I'm going home, going home. No Carolina is crying in my soul. Creator, I'm reaching. Under the earth, let us cut out a 
nation was free. But I hear Nigerian chains. They say I'm very real deep. Tobacco fields, charities, stolen people on stolen land. I'm going home. The music is there to help people to remember. Because the way I believe, I think our ancestors are always around us. And it's just with the society as it is, everybody's so plugged into TV and radio and, and unplugged from the land. Um, the relationship to it is kind of broken. When you know where you come from, your foot does not end where the earth begins. It goes deeper. You're rooted. So when you travel to all these places and you meet the people of the land, you, I mean, you're, you're meeting their ancestors because you're meeting generations upon generations on generations of family. You know, and so when we go to visit and perform in places, you know, we ask, you know, we thank the people of the land. We dedicate our music to the people of the land. I am the music. Puta Fey is the music. Jennifer is the music. We are the music together.
traditional schools in Hawaii. Uh, when you uh, come to our uh, beginning class, I ask a five-year commitment. That's how long it would take to uh, learn at least half of the repertoire that we have. And for you to make a decision whether you would like to have hula in your life. Um, and I also ask for hula to be a third priority in your life. You know, besides your family and your work, hula comes next. And this is the style of the hula aiha'a. It's a style that we are known for. All of Hawaii knows that our school is the school that dances the flat foot, bent knee position. We present some of our fire dances. <laughs> fire. from a very strong religious background. And when I say religious, it means we're tied into our environment. Our environment is our religion. There's a deep separation between Christianity and hula. What is interesting about it is that I came from, uh, I come from a very devout line of Mormons. We, we grew up in a world thinking that we have to choose. One is always right and one is always wrong. And it took me a number of years to, to come to the realization that there's no need to be right and wrong and black and white. That's, you know, so I found balance. And so when I need to, I pray to my Christian God. And when I'm doing a Hawaiian thing, I have to pray to the Hawaiian gods. <laughs> As far as Pele is concerned, our connection is that we, genealogically, we do come from that line. And we're privileged enough to have unbroken line of um, people who taught that the culture was worth saving. style is called Aiha'a, translated very low to the earth. It went through the maternal side of the family. It wasn't always in my immediate family. My grandmother's uh, oldest daughter took it over at one time. And, uh, it came down through my mom. And even if we have a crop of boys, sons, um, they still participate in dance.
first New England tour was in the early 80s with a traveling show that went to different cities, a traveling museum show of artifacts, and we were the live artifacts. <laughs> provides this opportunity for people to meet each other. Often if you're at a festival or at a public event and there's many people around, you attend the event, you sit in the chair, you listen to the music, but you don't really communicate with the person sitting beside you. Whereas if you have a little um, social occasion, a small ritual where people can share a cup of tea together, often a small conversation begins. And so this is their real purpose. Tea is more the media than the subject. The ritual of meeting is a performance. The art of human meeting is the finest art. And as Oscar Wilde said, tea is one of the few simple pleasures that we have left. Tea, doesn't matter how many turn up, you can just add a few more leaves and a bit more water, and you can invite more to your circle. So it becomes this first process of civilization where human beings gather and share together. To meet in a, such a festival and to be able to create these meetings between different communities and bring them together over the simple act of having a cup of tea and enjoying through when the soul has been risen or the, the spirit has been opened through the music, one wants to share that. It's a great opportunity to really meet the soul of Los Angeles. And even if all the banks and all the things fall apart, we can still get together. Uh, as long as we can have a few sticks and a bit of water, we could have a tea party. Sacred music to me is music that goes through one, music that really, where, where you become a, a vessel of, of, an, of an energy. La 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 la
Well, I came from a classical music background and folk music, and um, I was sitting at the piano vocalizing, and one day I had a kind of revelation that the voice could be an instrument and that it could have the flexibility of the spine or it could have the articulation of a hand, and that within the voice are characters and colors, textures and energies and landscapes, and that I could explore that as an expression of very fundamental human emotion. How I define spirit, God, or what is sacred is, um, I actually think that everything is sacred, that basic goodness is everything, and that um, you at sitting here with me now with this camera or me drinking a cup of coffee is also sacred if I'm aware of that moment and I'm not just uh, asleep. Dream Team and we're a group of young photojournalists. We're here to document the Sacred Music Festival and to learn what sacred music is. This whole festival was the idea of the Dalai Lama and hopefully we'll get to meet him. To make sacred means to make holy and the origin of the word holy is to make whole and that's I think what motivates us to be here today.
is it called? Instruments? The big one? Yeah, the big yeah, one. That's, uh, that's a Dongchin. It looks very hard to play. Oh, it's very hard. <laughs> what is sacred music to you? Actually, sacred music is um, some offering for the deities and like that. What has been the hardest thing for you since you become a monk? The hardest is the studies. Studies in Buddhist philosophy. Tibetan Buddhist philosophy. That's the hardest one. I asked my priest the same question and he said the hardest thing for him was celibacy. <laughs> what I've received now. Sacred music doesn't have to be religious. Sacred music can be something that sends a message to you that you believe in. I think sacred music is music that makes people feel good. Before they didn't have like PlayStation, all these electronic games, so fun I guess would be music. <laughs> What is sacred music to you? To me, it's when the music is right. It is sacred. You know, it's done from the heart, uh, done for, for no other purpose but to play. We're not so much playing for the audience, you know? I mean, that the audience is there and that they enjoy it, that's wonderful. But that, that the music is being done and it's a personal relationship between me and whatever I feel is, is God. I'm sending my sound out into the universe, and, and you know, that's what it's all about. Yeah. So you have questions, right? Okay, well, I Does think... Does everybody have that one paper of questions? I have questions. Yeah. What do you wish for in the new millennium? Do you miss your home in Tibet? How does it feel being who you are? Do you believe in a higher power? We'll have to like present the stars to the Dalai Lama, and he'll bless them. Special way. Yeah, in a special way, and he'll bless them. And give them back. The silence is killing me. Good afternoon and welcome to this meeting first session. This is the uh, sixth visit to the Los Angeles area beginning in 1979 and second to Pasadena. And now I'd like to talk open uh, for questions. Your Holiness, a few days ago uh, you compared the situation in East Timor with the situation in Tibet. Are we in Hollywood doing enough to spread the words of compassion? You visited Taiwan a few years ago. Do you plan to go back anytime soon? Would you tell us the status of uh, the so, uh, expected dialogue between your office and the Chinese? <clears throat> oh, yes, yes. My question was, uh, what are your views on um, the youth uh, position in spirituality? People everywhere are talking about the next century, the next millennium. Now, you are the people who really shape the new millennium. The important thing is study well, hard. At the same time, you should have clear aim, but vision about the future, how to use the education of knowledge. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
a gift. I have one. I, I have a gift for you. I took that one. Oh. <laughs> so. This gets quite beautiful. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Dalai Lama has one of my pictures hanging in his pad now. Sacred music to me is really about one's attitude as you're creating and presenting the music. There are things seen and things unseen. And I think music in general, and uh, sacred music specifically, speaks to those things that are unseen. Oh, 
Awakener, and it's inspired by a trip to India and meeting a man who's writing a book about a conversation he has with God. And he, some of the questions he puts to God are, are funny or fanciful, and others are very serious. So I wanted to get both those qualities into the music, and at the end, to put something about the ethereal and cosmic nature of God into the song. And I live in your heart. For me, I would define spiritual God by quoting the Indian spiritual master Meher Baba, who once responded to the question, what is God, by saying, God is the one who provokes this question in you. She's saying that the music uh, is uh, nutrition, spiritual nutrition for humanity, not just Cubans, not just Puerto Ricans, but everyone in the world. I had to seek out masters such as Lázaro, and we studied with them in order to learn our own culture and maintain it for our generation 
and those generations to come. The tradition is an oral tradition. I didn't go look up stuff in books to learn what I learned. Um, I learned fr from masters and elders, uh, stuff that's passed down to you through, through voice. Through, it's an oral tradition. You know, I was raised here uh, in the United States, and when I went to Cuba the, for the first time, and I went and sat down on a bata drone, and a master that I just first met saw me play bata, he started crying because the oral tradition reached America and reached it word by word exactly the way he taught it to his son. Tendencia familiar con nuestro gran mother, gran father, is from the baby. This is the only one. They open my eyes. The friend I see in my, my heart is drum and sing it. This is inside of my heart. The tradition of speaking in wordless melodies is really ancient. You know, chanting is ancient. I spent hours at a Toys R Us aisle and we were just like five-year-olds playing all, every, pushing every button, like, ah, laughing and doing all the samples and running around with swords and just like, and all the little kids were like gravitating to us because we were having so much fun. But we ended up buying so many things just because they made great sounds. The next piece is the bongo song. People who have been role models to me have been people who have really enjoyed what they've done and have shown that and have, there's been this sense of delight and wonder and miracle and magic that it's about something they do and I will think to myself, I want to be like that person. And if, if what we do um, has anybody thinking that, however old they are, and they'll go home in the kitchen and experiment with the strainer, then, I don't know, I think that's passing it on. Native people who look at this music in a traditional way, they don't consider someone like myself a flute player. We're flute carriers, as in being a pipe carrier. There's a responsibility associated with it. Dalai Lama made a point about widening your horizons, you know, for me that means to tell people to step outside their box. I think when you step outside your box, you recognize that it's not, there, it's not they, it's we, and that and we each have 100% responsibility for, for what we create. This festival makes me feel very optimistic. The reception that it's getting from the public makes me feel very optimistic. When you start widening your horizon, you know, you become more tolerant and compassionate toward people whose ways are different than yours and maybe you don't understand them because you, you didn't grow up in that way, but you're more forgiving. get to learn a lot about ourselves and how to and how to relate with each other and how to make it work because it's not easy being in any kind of group and then can you imagine six women i mean it's, it's you know one way once we're together it's like a flower you know uh, we planted the seed and and to, the togetherness the communication the understanding 
it starts to bloom and grow and turn into a beautiful flower. The drum is such a sacred instrument, it has such a beautiful and long history. I really have to respect it and honor it. We're playing rhythms, we're playing them in our own way, but we're playing rhythms that are, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years old. And so it's like, it's like a bridge back in time. You come with what you come with and your background and then that's all there is to it. You just keep to your roots and then the rest of it is like when you respect other people's culture, other people's roots, then, you, you know, there's a lot of trees that grows right one next to another. Yeah. And I don't know if you can tell, but we have a ball up here. So if they're having half as much fun as we are, then, you know, yeah. we've yeah. done yeah. the we job. We see the faces so and we're just like, yeah, it's nice. these names of, of God and the names that you, you hear from different traditions. So rhythm came with, with the names. It's, this is like a heartbeat. It's like, you know, the heartbeat has two pieces to it, boop, 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 boop. But it's like, I slowed it down a little bit. <laughs> I got a cool heart. <laughs> It's my voice, um, but it's the voice of God that is giving me the tone, that is giving me the harmony, that is placing me where I need to be and allowing me to hear that which needs to come through me in that particular moment. That's a part of our philosophy. The presence of God is all in all things that it's, it's an undifferentiated wholeness. It's about being inclusive, and people approach the Spirit through different ways. Some people say Jehovah, Father, Mother, God. Uh, they see God as Divine Mother, or Infinite Presence, Baba. And so we wanted all of that to be included so that people would get a feeling that Everyone, not that everyone, that everyone was, that, that all these places had their equal place in the world. That when you strip away the culture and the history of mystical traditions, at bottom, they're pretty much the same thing. is also a singer even though even though we are praying there's still the element that we have a vocal instrument that we have to deal with and I had a I had a teacher once who, who put it so beautifully he said that the the vocal instrument the voice box figuratively lies between the mind and the heart and if either one of those are in any kind of distress if your body is in distress representing the heart if your if your mind is in distress representing your emotions the voice box is right smack dab in the middle and it can affect the way you sing. 
You know what, David danced about 30 miles and saying, We get information with our mind and we try to bring it out with our soul. But that's all the time is not the honest part of us. Uh, but the spirit of the man is the honest part. That's the part that God talks to. When the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will sing like David sang. When the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will sing like David Once I begin to sing, Something takes over me. Um, you can call it whatever you like. I call it the Spirit of God, and I call it the Holy Spirit living inside of me. Just do whatever you want to do to my soul tonight. Just oh, bless man, me. Let every one yes. of these words go down the bottom of my feet and come up out of the top of my head. When the Spirit of the Lord comes up I will sing Los Angeles is really a place where things come together. For us, this is a coming home. Because Balinese Gamelan in the United States really started here, here at UCLA, in fact. Uh, the vision of mantlehood uh, and starting the Institute for Ethnomusicology was the, the notion of bringing the Gamelan here and having teachers come, that you couldn't simply study this music in a book. In very practical ways, in Bali, when we perform in the temple, we we're performing as an offering. So that it's like this, you know, it's like we're giving this to the temple, but it's in the form of music or dance or something like that. We all make a conscious effort to bring ourselves together before performance. In fact, we circle up just before the show is about to start. And one of our Balinese guest artists sprinkles us with holy water, which is exactly what would happen in Bali. And uh, he or she also goes out to the gamelan and does a special offering right at the gong, which is considered the heart of the ensemble. And that's a very conscious effort to really focus our attentions. Thank you. 
shared. In fact, one of the major tenets is something called koteka, in which you have a musical pattern, and that musical pattern only comes together when two people are playing and it comes into an interlocking part. We're learning this music oral. We're not learning it from a page. So at some point, it becomes a part of your body. an offering is something that we give of ourselves without hoping necessarily for anything in return. But in the end, what's really important is what's inside of us at that moment. Tulsidas read a petition to Ram. He said, hey, Ram. Hey, 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 Ram. I've, I've lived my whole life uh, worshiping you, and, and I, I haven't gotten nowhere. Sing along. Hey, hey, Ram. Hey, Ram. that I do with the Pagan Lover Orchestra is based on the ancient Indian tradition of chanting, of devotional chanting, which is a method of repeating the names of God over and over and over, the name of God, the name of Goddess, in order to come into total communion. Most of the mystical music performed at the festival is in its origin, not performed on a stage. There's actually no distinction between performer and audience. For many mystics, music is part of daily life. Jai Uttal spent time here in Bengal with the Baals, a mystic sect for whom music is an essential spiritual practice. This is the tailor shop of a Muslim mystic, Kalu Fakir. Some friends have dropped by on their way home from work. There's a ball, 
Hindu. Hindu. A Christian. Another Muslim. My name is Muhammad Nizamuddin. I'm Taylor. Together they play each other's devotional songs. Bows of Bengal were an amazing influence on me and my music. It's actually the main instrument I play, the dotar is a bow instrument. They use their song to, to like just reach into the sky, into heaven, and grab hold of God. song is for the prophet's sake about love and repentance. The ensemble includes two instruments that are used in Sufi gatherings in Egypt. These are the reef flute and large finger cymbals. Hasidim are the main practitioners today of Jewish mysticism, and music has a strong role in their spiritual lives. An important group meditation involves the repetition of a special phrase or melody called a nigun. The Baal Shem's nigun. Hasidism's founder, the Baal Shem Tov, was a natural mystic who lived in the mountains for seven years, meditating and studying. Later, he brought mysticism to the masses, urging all to find joy through music and dance. The Baal Shem introduced the wordless song because music, music was the way to commune with God. One of the central themes of the Jewish religion is the science of making the ordinary into a holy. One of the ways we do this is through a lovely Jewish ceremony called Havdalah. <laughs> Havdalah, it's coming back, coming back into the world by stimulating the senses. Accept these spice box. These are modern Jewish mystics, actually descendants of the movement begun by the Baal Shem Tov. Another example of people who use music as part of their daily prayers. This happened to take place in L.A. during the festival. But for them, it's a weekly Saturday night ceremony. A 
It's not information the mystic is interested in, but transformation. Music, transformation, it's a synonym. It's a synonym for the mystic. To do it with jazz, do it with rock. But the root of it, the heart of it, is that mystic union with the divine. And that's what the music is about, and that's where the music comes from. If I had to give anybody proof that God is real, I'd say, look at me. <laughs> look at my life, and I'd tell them, this is how it used to be, but this is how God has worked in my life now. You can give someone the word of God, um, but unless they receive it within their spirit, it, it's no good to them. That's what makes me gospel music and, and, and spiritual music sacred, is because the ability for it to heal uh, a wounded heart, the ability for it to um, help you do uh, hard times. alcoholic and uh, divorced so I had some bad experiences even though I walked through the valley in the shadow of death I would feel no evil for thou art with me up in the 90s I was hurting so and discouraged and dismayed and all that type of thing and so I thought it was time for me to go back into church surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever the black experience is what produces gospel music, the African American experience in America. Through gospel music, we have been able to show our strength and to our and to show our relationship with God. Uh, music is that thing that crosses all boundaries, all races. The one thing that we all had in common uh, was our ability to relate to music. Christianity was something we picked up from the Europeans and we carried it on. <laughs> so when we got hold of it and put it with our music, then gospel music was born. And in, in, in the days of slavery, when it, there was no hope, uh, hardly any hope at all, it was through the music that we uh, conveyed our strength and our hope to our children and carried them into the future. That was something, the one thing that we had that could uplift each other and keep each other going. For me, religion, you know, it can't just be something where you sit and go to church on Sundays. It has to be doing something. And I felt that this church uh, embodied everything that I had been taught by my father as a child, that religion was all about. It's about loving people and working. You 
can't sit still when gospel music is going on because you got to clap your hands and you got to pat your feet. I don't care what culture you come from, what religious doctrine, you can be an atheist, but when gospel music singers are up singing, you're going to do something because it moves you. <laughs> God have done for me. He brought me so far. He's been so good to me. And so I'm singing about this good God that I serve and it's just uplifting me. The Holy Spirit that is in this music and the, the feeling that the singers have when they are conveying it to you is the feeling that you get when you sing it and that feeling conveys itself. The gospel music is real. It is something that stirs the soul. It makes the inside of your bones tingle. as a performing choir. We are a worshiping choir. Our job is to excite the spirit of the person and bring them into the presence of the deity. Our job is like a mother with her children. She brings her children to the table and she feeds them. Our job is to feed the souls of the people, to open them up, to prepare them, to excite them. We excite them to the point that they are ready to receive the good news, which is the Word of God. is setting on the last day of the festival and it's just perfect with almost 2,000 people here enjoying each other, enjoying the event and the music and the coming together and the variety of cultural experience. It's just what we would hope for the festival and especially for an ending event of the festival. Someone's in need of a prayer today Have you done your part? Someone's in despair this day Have you prayed from the heart? So many are trying to find their way And they need your love
Did you give your all in prayer? The world is in need of what are you say. Did you answer the call and pray? You see, so many are seeking the way to go. And they need your light, you know, for a prayer above. I know it can. Gives them power every day. It heals, it heals them, sustains them. Thank you. 